First of all, it's an honor to be with the author of Ecotopia, which changed my life as, as it did so many others, and inspired me to write Solartopia. And so what I'd like to talk about is just getting from Ecotopia uh, the, vi the first vision uh, of, a, of an ecological society to Solartopia, which is a vision of you know, a renewable-powered society with a lot of specifics in it. So uh, I read Ecotopia in the early 70s, and I re just reread it. And what's uh, shocking and amazing and gratifying to me, as I'm sure it is to you, is uh, how much of it came true. <laughs> um, not enough. Not, not enough. enough. <laughs> well, we got, uh, so what, what inspired you to, to write Ecotopia? Well, the story actually begins with sewage. I had written a book called Living Poor with Style, which was a guide to how you can live better on less, one of the first ones in a now enormous library of that stuff. And uh, I was looking around for a new project, and I had been brought up in the country in central Pennsylvania on 10 acres where everything was recycled because there was nobody to haul it away or do anything to it. And so I was dimly aware that we were living in a society of, at that time, about 200 million people all eating away, pooping away, and all the waste was just being gotten rid of, as we thought at the time. It was being burned, it was being barged out to sea, it was uh, you know, everything except recycling it as nutrient material mm -hmm. back onto the land. <clears throat> and I thought, there's something really crazy going on mm -hmm. here, bi biologically crazy. And um, so I began to write this article called The Scandal of Our Sewage, which was all about how we were making a big mistake. And uh, I started going to the Berkeley University of California Sanitary Engineering Library. Believe it or not, Berkeley has such a thing. And I discovered that in our society, when you have two paths, and path A is cheaper than path B, you take path A even though path B is biologically sane and path A is not. Now, the world is full mm -hmm. of things like that, as you well know. Um, and I got very depressed at this, and I began looking around the world. I looked at Cuba, I looked at China, I looked at European countries. Nobody was getting their bleep together. <laughs> and I thought, well, at some point a light went on, and I thought, if there is no country that's doing this utterly fundamental thing right, maybe it's time to invent one. So I sat down and I wrote the section on food to sewage to fertilizer to more food, the, mm -hmm. the so-called stable state recycling system that's really the basic article of fate, faith of the ecotopians as they developed. And I looked at that and I remember thinking, well, if anybody's smart enough to get that right, they'd probably do a lot of other stuff differently too, wouldn't they? And for example, and then I started thinking about land use and energy systems and transportation and all the other things that finally made up the book. And I think probably one of the ones I've been thinking, of course, about the differences between your approach and mine. And one of them is that ecotopia is really at bottom biological and anthropological. Mm -hmm. I, I used to hang around with a lot of anthropologists up here on campus in Berkeley. And I also knew some at the University of Chicago when I was a student there. And so I'm always trying to look at social structures, you know, how do institutions evolve, how mm -hmm. do things change socially. And also, because I grew up in the country and my father was a professor of agriculture, I, and I did a lot of gardening and stuff as a kid, I was always very oriented toward the biological side of life. And so those things combined as I tried to imagine this country that did not yet exist, but would, I hope, someday exist, uh -huh. I began to stir all those ingredients mm. into the pot, too. And it was great fun. Was oh, God, it's, fun. it's so much know. fun to read. Um, so, are you, were you living in Ecotopia when you wrote it? Were you living in California? I was living in the middle of Berkeley, the way uh -huh. I live right here now, uh -huh. <laughs> in a very ordinary sort of way. People, I think, expect me to be a back-to-the-lander, which I, I came from the land, so I've never uh -huh. had much of an impulse to go back to it. Uh, and in a way, Ecotopia is really about eco-cities, about how our cities can be sustainable if we go about it right. And uh, our agriculture and our forestry and our fisheries and everything needs to be made sustainable. But the cities, which is where most of us live and therefore where most of the impacts are, are really the top priority to get right. Excellent. Go ahead. And then you had a great plot, of course. 
Well, that's a good sex in there. A little sex and violence helps a novel to get <laughs> yeah. people's attention. Yeah, right, I think right, so. right. Terrific. <laughs> so what, what from Ecotopia has come true? Well, you know, many things have not come true. Maybe we should get some of those out of the way. And everything connected to the automobile, we have backslid since the 70s mm -hmm. when I was writing Ecotopia. There are more cars. We drive them more. They produce more global warming gases, more pollutant gases, more everything. Um, well, you had a mass transit system in, in Ecotopia. In Ecotopia, that, we have really a very worked. mass. And Ecotopia, like your Solartopia, is very decentralized. Mm -hmm. So there's not so much moving around with machines of any kind. Um, much more walking, much more bicycling, much more uh, local transit uh, oriented things. Um, and we've made a little progress in that, and we are making some more, and we will have to make much more, of course, as post peak oil comes on. And uh, in that respect, I think you can also be kind of hopeful in the, in the fact that the thinking of city planners and to a large extent city officials for that matter has really undergone a revolution since Ecotopia came out. It's not due to Ecotopia particularly, but it's the legacy of Jane Jacobs, the, uh, uh -huh. what was it called, the death and life of great American cities and people who have followed that kind of thinking about what makes cities valuable and above all what makes them efficient because cities are really a much more efficient way to have human beings living than dispersed throughout the countryside everybody with a car and a separate homestead and a you know a 20 mile road to get where they live what we need to do is make our cities more compact and more efficient and to make them produce both energy as you have in Solartopia and for that matter, food. Mm -hmm. um, our city, Paris, was a food exporter into the 19th century. Hmm. And if the French could do it, we could do it. <laughs> right. Well, all those <laughs> baguettes went, went out. So, uh, well, when I read Ecotopia, I thought this was really a great thing. And, uh, 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 I, you know, it inspired me. I was living on a commune, mm -hmm. and we were uh, farming organically. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the way we made this connection to Solartopia is that living on this organic farm, reading Solartopia and emulating many aspects of it, uh, the, the local utility came in and tried to build a nuclear plant <laughs> four miles to our ha from our house. And we, of course, were thrilled. Uh, and we organized, we coined the phrase no nukes. And we actually stopped them. Uh, and where they wanted to build the, the Montague, Massachusetts nuclear plant is now a, a nature preserve right on the Connecticut River. It's a great thing. Um, <clears throat> but when I sat down to write Solartopia, I wanted to take the ecotopian vision and um, imply it to the whole world in a society that has gone totally to renewables. And so, uh, and I was very um, committed to not having any magical inventions, which is true in solar to ecotopia. Ecotopia is very down to earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, it is not a um, an implausible scenario. Let's put that. And politically, the idea of California, Oregon, and uh, Washington seceding. Uh, we did have a civil war. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If it might yet happen, though. <laughs> yeah, I, I so don't know. It, well, a, we, we can, nation states may be dinosaurs that we haven't quite recognized as dinosaurs yet. But it's true that I was trying to be very realistic, very conservative technically. I didn't want anybody to say, oh, that's cute, but it's science fiction. Right. And uh, we don't want people to fail to realize that the problems are really political. I mean, right. if you want to call Ecotopia by a category, it should probably be politics fiction, because I made this uh, wild metaphorical assumption that there might be a breakaway of Northern California, Oregon, and Washington, who would then go their own ecological way to save their ecological skins, right. and uh, that that would be a kind of a beacon for the rest of the world to mm -hmm. follow. Now, in Solartopia, you've taken a much more daring leap to say that not only this little tiny, specially gifted quarter could do it, but the whole world should Right. Well, of course, we do start with Denmark, which Good is start. probably more like solar to ecotopia than any other country on Earth, really, at this point in time. And, but the Danes uh, had a Green Party, which was partly inspired, I understand, by ecotopia. Maybe. And um, uh, they have their own little community, Christiania, which mm -hmm. is a, a green community. Mm -hmm. uh, but they also pioneered utility-scale wind farming. Mm -hmm. and, and so the point of solartopia is that we uh, successfully, in a technical sense, convert our entire energy supply to renewables and efficiency, which is very doable. I mean, if we, just as everything in Ecotopia is doable and much of it proved to be done, you know, over the last 30 years, in Solartopia, uh, we have the wind, 
uh, technology. We have the turbines. We have the f uh, solar panels. We know enough about biofuels and ocean thermal and, and geothermal and, the other, and recycling um, that we could do it. And, and you know, in Solartopia, we have the enemy, which is King Kong, coal, oil, nukes, and gas, which I had a lot of fun with, <laughs> obviously. And uh, once we've defeated King Kong politically, if we, act, if we, the reality is if we wiped the earth clean of all uh, fossil and nuclear generators, we could install with available technology sufficient renewable resources to run the planet without a, a blink in the lights. I mean, that, that, that's, and that's part of the point of solar. It was kind of refreshing to see that Al Gore gets that. Uh, he does <laughs> to a certain extent, although we have some issues with Al Gore. For example, mm -hmm. he wants to now build a, a national grid which I am very, very dubious of because of uh, the electromagnetic fields and the, the sheer uh, logistics of doing that. Plus, we have a model that's decentralized, as, as Ecotokia is decentralized, and we want community-controlled energy. And, um, and that would not come with a, an Al Gore model of uh, a national you know, superconducting grid. Al Gore has also failed at this point in time uh, to take on the nuclear power industry which we think is the cutting edge of the old, bad old technology. The current line about nuclear power is that it's so 20th century. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, it's funny, um, when you were talking about you were originally getting into this through an anti-nuke uh, struggle, uh, the same thing was true in Germany, actually. Mm -hmm. The beginnings of the green movement in Germany were around Freiburg in southwestern Germany, mm -hmm. the so-called banana belt of Germany where there's a, a university and a very splendidly preserved town that wasn't apparently bombed much during World War II. And <clears throat> the um, German authorities wanted to build a huge nuke outside town. And the farmers and the townsfolk right. and the students all got together and said, no nukes. That's right. And it was out of that that the Green Party in Germany, which was, I know for a fact, very influenced by Ecotopia, yeah. really sprang uh, into being. Well, they also in Germany did the first um, occupation of a site. In other words, they didn't just <coughs> demonstrate, they actually physically grabbed hold of a site in Wiehl, W Y H L, uh, West Germany, and that was the inspiration for our demonstrations at Seabrook, which uh, I was fortunate enough to be involved in. So, but in 75, just as Solartopia, as Ecotopia was around, we had a conference in Amherst, Massachusetts. It was the Toward Tomorrow Fair. And at that conference, we pretty much crafted a clear vision that we would have an ecotopia that would be totally solar powered. Uh, that uh, we thought photovoltaic cells would come on first, but uh, as it turns out, wind uh, is cheaper and easier. I mean, there were windmills in Persia in the 1400s. There was actually a windmill in Manhattan in 1660 <laughs> when it was New Amsterdam. When the Dutch were there. Yeah. When the Dutch yeah, were there. My exactly. ancestors. Yes. Uh, so. Uh, you know, uh, the, the vision of a totally green-powered ecotopian reality, was, which is what I put into Solartopia, uh, is about 30, you know, 35 years old now. And, and mm -hmm. it pretty much dates at, at birth to when Ecotopia came out. Mm -hmm. So the, the move, um, you know, the technological interchange, which is what I lay out in Solartopia, is pretty um, easy to do in certain senses. I noticed you also included geothermal, which a lot of people don't do and which I think is very important, among other reasons, because we happen to have a bunch of oil corporations lying around the planet who are very good at drilling, drilling deep holes. wells. Yes, right. And since that's what we need to tap uh -huh. geothermal for electric generation, we would be in good shape if we could uh, tr transform yeah, them from I agree. Uh, <laughs> fuel producers to geothermal producers. Of course, the corporations have managed to uh, find ways to make geothermal you know, a negative. For example, when they wanted to do geothermal in Hawaii, they picked the, the most sacred yeah. piece of land on the big <laughs> island. It's yeah. like, give me a break. <laughs> but so <clears throat> another of the great things about Ecotopia is that the politics, I mean, you, you get the politics and there's no escape. There's a very political book. And um, in Solartopia, you know, the, the first draft was just the translation, uh, the technical transformation. Okay, we take the wind here, we put the PV here, we have the green roofs. We have the geothermal, we have the biofuels, which are not food-based. You know, we don't use corn and soy. We have the incredible inedibles, which are uh, uh, hemp, of course, and switchgrass and algae and the other great crops. But the second step, and the step that's essential as it was in Ecotopia, is breaking the corporations. 
I mean, you can't have corporations structured the way they are and still have a, an equitopian, solartopian. You know, reality. when the banks began to come unglued and in the investment uh, companies and so on, I, I was thinking of a passage in Ecotopia where the narrator Weston meets an Ecotopian militant who says, well, you know, we kind of welcomed economic collapse and the yeah. flight of capital because we knew that that could be turned to advantage, you know, sort of a uh, Tai Chi right. move or something like that. And lo and behold, something like that is actually happening in the country now with, you know, limitations, mm -hmm. investments. And I notice in Solartopia you often say that good things happen and then some bad things keep right. on happening too, which is the way reality is, unfortunately. But we, it looks like we are going to have some really serious moves on the sustainable energy, renewable energy system. And it looks like we are going to probably get some kind of national health program. So out of chaos and catastrophe right. can come, you know, it, it loosens up the rock pile that American politics tends to be. Right. Where all the rocks are settled in so tight amongst each other that nothing can move. Well, it, of course, a $750 billion blank check isn't going to do it for the banks. And we really need to uh, grab hold of this transformational moment. And, of course, we're all hoping that the Obama administration, you know, Bush, we couldn't push. We couldn't make Bush do anything, but we could stop him from doing certain things. Some things. Uh, Obama, hopefully, you know, will be able to push. And you're exactly right. I mean, this breakdown... Uh, all this, all this opposition, the socialism, all these years, <laughs> you know, which called for the nationalization of the banking system, and suddenly we have a private banking system, and it collapses. And where do they go? They go back. They, they go to the government. If we've been controlling the banking system all along, it might have been a lot better. So in Solartopia, we we do presume a major collapse based on on uh, you know energy, as you do in Ecotopia. And uh, the question is, who's going to control it? Corporations or the public? You know, I'm just redoing my website, and one of the things I'm putting on it is a piece I wrote maybe 10 years ago, I guess, called The Coming Eco-Industrial Complex. And in this little modest proposal, I argue that this is still ups and downs and roundabouts. It's still a country in which if you want to get something big done, you bribe corporations to do it. That's <laughs> right. what we did in World War II. That's what we did in other wars. Well, you That's what we did too, in the though. space. We strong arm a little, but uh -huh. mostly, basically, you pay yeah. them off. And Congress gets in bed with a substantial business elite. And they pump public money mm -hmm. into these guys' pockets, and they do what the nation through the Congress says ought to be done. And what we've been doing, of course, is a, is a permanent war economy and all the things that have gone with that that Eisenhower warned us about. Now, right. and can, Washington. And, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can we then contemplate the Congress getting smart enough to say, you know, we don't really want Bechtel building incredible bases in Iraq. We want them rebuilding eco-cities in America. And here's the money, boys. Go to it. If we can learn this kind of game, maybe mm -hmm. some things. The price is always high. This is not a, not a beautiful system to operate in, although it may be better than alternatives, I don't know. But at any rate, it's what we have, it's what we're stuck with. Maybe we can use the engine of corrupt Congress and uh, greedy industrialists to build Solartopia yeah. or Ecotopia. Well, the, the, I recently wrote a piece called um, General Motors Must uh, remake the mass transit system it murdered. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you have a, a mass transit system in Ecotopia that works. And in Solartopia, uh, we talk about the, the destruction of the American mass transit system, the deliberate destruction by General Motors, Standard Oil, one of those conspiracy theories that we know is true, and, and, and it has to be rebuilt. And so, uh, aside from the technical fixes that are, uh, you know, on the production of energy side, the rebuilding of the mass transit system is critical. Yeah. And that was... That was, that was kind of an unfair advantage that Ecotopia had was, the, you know, a, a good uh, mass transit system, which is going to be very expensive, but it has to be done. I know Phoenix just opened a, a billion and a half uh, dollar mass transit system. Yeah. I'm actually a partisan of buses. You know, people uh -huh. think light rail is more dramatic, more glamorous, and more middle class, and people will be more willing to ride it. But I think if we had better buses, more sort of uh, uh, stylish and uh, comfortable and uh, commodious buses, people would ride them also. And buses, since they can run on any ordinary city street, have a far less 
big capital requirement at the beginning. Right. Um, and the other thing that goes without <laughs> enough ener without enough honor in our society is taxis. You know, taxis are a very ancient invest invention. They go back into I don't know the Middle Ages. I mm -hmm. think people had horse-drawn taxis, and taxis have the great virtue of fle total flexibility, just like privately owned cars. So I think what's going to happen actually is some weird kind of merger between buses, taxis, light rail, um, not so light rail, and also things like jitneys mm -hmm. and car share companies. Now car share companies are doing very well in the United States in many big cities. Uh -huh. And I like this idea a lot because a lot of the problems of the private car do not have to do with how we power them or you know what exhaust they produce in the atmosphere. It's the effects they have on our land use. And the fewer, I'll put it the other way, the more people that can use one vehicle of whatever kind it is, mm -hmm. the less damage they're going right. to do. So that's a kind of a, that's one of the hopeful things that's going on. I, I find that the, the price of gas used to not make much difference. It would go up to maybe mm -hmm. $3, three, people didn't care. When it got to four fifty or so, yeah, so people yeah. began to change their habits. And one of the things they began to do was join car share companies. And that's a really good piece of news. Well, we see now, though, so that the, uh, with the, even when the price of gas has gone down, people have continued to ride mass transit, which they is are. a hugely yeah. ecotopian, yeah. solartopian development. I think with uh, mass transit, you know, in solartopia, we, re we re rebuild the inter-city rails. And then inside the cities, all, all American cities over 2,500, had a light rail system prior to the onslaught of General Motors. Mm -hmm. Is the you know the trunk lines are all rail, and then the buses and the jitneys and the taxis all work into the into the yeah. capillaries, I guess you yeah. call them of the of the system. Yeah, it's a good it's a good hybrid. Mm -hmm. um, and and with biofuels, I mean you know we have this one thing that's come true both from Equatopia and Solartopia is we have a, um, a solar powered bus system in Thousand Palms, California, where they have a photovoltaic array which creates hydrogen and the hydrogen power of the city, city buses. So, so that's your ideal bus situation. I don't know how yeah. much mm. you're interested in alcohol these days. But there's a man named David Bloom, B-L-U-M-E, <coughs> uh -huh. who has written a book called, a very giant book, as he's a hands-on alcohol guy, uh, a permaculture orientation, basically. His book is called Alcohol Can Be a Gas. <laughs> I've and seen he, it, yeah. He contends that there are things like fodder beets, which are apparently gigantic yes, beets. Yes, and Jerusalem artichokes. Jerusalem artichokes mm -hmm. and things like cattails. Now, the interesting thing about cattails is, yeah. is that they like to grow in marshy things yes. like, for example, sewage lagoons. Right. They clean the sewage. They pr provide biomass that you can turn into alcohol. Right. And so we may see an awful lot of cattails in well, it's, Ecotopia or solar. You know, when we talk about biomass, we talk about uh, plants that are actually pollutants. Cattails are a real major um, uh, pest in the Everglades and in other places, you know, pristine uh, ecosystems that we're trying to save. Kudzu would be a fabulous source of, uh, <laughs> of biofuel, right? Just go and rip it off all the trees in the south. And algae. Now, algae blooms are, uh, of course, catastrophic in the Gulf of Mexico, mm -hmm. but algae is going to be, I think, the, the, the staple of the biofuel industry because, you know, there's a couple hundred um, different species of algae. And what you need to grow algae is water and carbon dioxide. And so in Solartopia, you know, I see algae as being a huge staple of the biofuel industry. Yeah, I, I agree with you about algae. I, you know, one of the things about our scientific orientation in the 20th century and the 21st century is that it's been physics dominated, right. not enough biology dominated. And when you start talking about microorganisms, you see people's eyes sort of glaze over. Yeah. But microorganisms run the world, really. Right. Uh, the well, they have great sex world. lives. Well, <laughs> certainly very unusual ones. <laughs> we won't get into that. Yeah, all well, right. <laughs> but I think that uh, as we learn to live better with the mm -hmm. microorganisms on the planet, <coughs> excuse me, we will find a lot of um, new possibilities opening up. Too. Right. So I, I see in, the, in Solartopia, though, I see biofuels is really the major use for biofuels would be air travel. Uh, we, we're not going to have electric powered airplanes. And I don't think hydrogen will be practical for air travel for many, many uh, years, if ever. And so if we're going to duplicate kerosene, in an ecologically sound way, it's going to come from biofuels. I'm not sure we're really going to need much biofuel for ground-based transportation. We will have alcohol buses and so on, <clears throat> but they may, may they may yet run on PV-generated electricity. 
Well, it depends a lot on how adaptable, well, how cheap to produce and how adaptable hydrogen turns out to be, because there are difficult technical problems about storing and transmitting and, and piping hydrogen. You know, in all these things, as, as you know as well as I do, the question is um, whether you can convert one form of energy into other forms of energy efficiently. We, we ultimately are going to be living in a solar a solar world because that's all the incoming right. energy we've got. I mean, geothermal is an exception to that. But and, and the tides, we're doing enough. We, have, we do have some lunar energy also. The, the yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, it's funny, you could consider tidal energy sort of geothermal <laughs> energy in yeah. a way. So we're going to be basically in a solar world, but the question always is how you get from one layer of energy down to another one. When you convert solar energy into either directly into electricity or into a hydrogen, form, you are, you are always calculating what are the most efficient things to do. And you have some very ingenious examples of that in Solartopia. And little by little, in the real world, people are beginning to cope with this too. Um, I think one of the fundamental things that's, that's changing in our world sort of attitudes these days is getting away from the idea that energy comes from burning. I mean, right, for a hundred, exactly, well, right. more than that, because in the beginning we were burning wood, mm -hmm. which is a form of stored solar energy, too, right, for that but matter. very complicated. Then we were burning coal, which was stored solar energy from mm -hmm. way, 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 way back, oil the same way. Finally, we are getting to the point where we have to think about the solar energy that's coming in right now, and right. how are we going to live on this in, in real time, in current time. But I think the understanding that that's the problem has now spread beyond enthusiasts like you and me mm -hmm. into the general technological community. And not only that, but the investment community. There are a lot of people in and around Silicon Valley and so on who are putting up stupendous sums of money to right. get into all this stuff. Well, I have a, I had a radio show in Columbus, Ohio, and we've had people on from the solar businesses. And the only, they, you know, everybody else is going broke. And these guys are coming on and telling me they're doubling their business mm -hmm. every year mm -hmm. in Ohio. So the solar topian economy really works. I think uh, the, the, mis the massive my, um, paradigm shift, you know, Hazel Henderson and so many others have talked about a paradigm shift, and Ecotopia was the first really to think in those terms, and now Solartopia um, it, it was in the 20th century, we can do it this way now, in the 20th century the idea was that what was good for the economy was going to, uh, what was good for the environment was expensive. And it was gonna, we, we wanted to save the earth, but it was going to cost us money and jobs and <clears throat> the paradigm shift, which we've, which we have pushed, all these years has now come to be, which is people understand that what's good for the environment is not only, not only good for the economy; it's essential to the economy, and that we're not going to have an economic future without an ecotopia and a solartopia, because that's where the the jobs and the future really is. So, um, but the also the other part of uh, ecotopia and solartopia uh, that they have in common is they're both very feminist books. And, um, you know, I, I, when I was trying to, after I did all the work on the technical conversion to renewable energy, there were some other nagging issues not dealt with, which population control. You know, how do you control, what do you do about 6 billion to 10 billion people, you know, 6 billion going to 10 billion or whatever people on the planet? And, and uh, partly inspired by Ecotopia, it's clear to me, uh, especially knowing people who are Catholic, <laughs> and tr that... It's women who have to control the future of population. If women are empowered, uh, not only with access to birth control, but education, equal uh, pay, prosperity, you know, wherever women um, uh, have equal rights, pro uh, population diminishes. Mm -hmm. And so I think that women, the women of the earth in league with Mother Earth in Solartopia and Ecotopia will be the ones who decide how many people we have and how population will be controlled. Yeah, I agree entirely with that. And in addition, in Ecotopia, the women have a very strong attitude that they are in control of their bodies, right. which includes whether or not they have children. And I think that the universal experience of demography in the last 20 or 30 years is if you give women the things that you've just listed, they have substantially less children. Even in very highly religious cultures, the lowest birth rates in the world are now in formerly Catholic, well, still nominally Catholic countries like Italy, Spain, Quebec. These have had a stunning downturn right. in f fertility, which is what we need everywhere. The problem with the world is not that we have too, much, too many people in general. We have too many rich people, too many high-consuming people. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and if we can continue to have populations in the industrial world decline, we'll be a lot better off. Right, and that, I think that has to be done with women. Um, as, as you say, then, then of course the, the other little um, small details in getting to eco-solartopia, uh, we have to abolish war. Obviously, I mean, you mentioned being in a war economy, and there's no room for war in either ecotopia or solartopia. And one of the great things, being a historian, you know, reading ecotopia, you're kind of waiting for the shoe to drop, right? For the for the traditional United States just to send in the troops, but it, thankfully it doesn't happen, you know, <laughs> and and it, and then obviously it doesn't happen in solartopia either. We we just can't afford this anymore. It may be that we have already entered without realizing it, a world in which war doesn't work anymore. I mean, it didn't work in Vietnam, it didn't work in Iraq, it isn't working in Afghanistan. Right. Maybe the powers that still exist, which are capable of making war, are going to wake up and say, wait a minute, we have to try something else to get what we want right. or what we need. And that would certainly be a great day if one of the things that Obama can do is to get us turned around from the military solution always being the thing we go for toward political and, for that matter, social and ecological solutions being the things we go for. But because when you look at the wars that have happened or that are likely to happen in the war in the world today, they are mostly over resource questions, they're over political questions. Even the war in the Middle East, it's partly a cultural war and so on and so forth, but above all it's a war about water. The Israelis have That's controlled right. almost all the water in the West Bank. And um, most wars that we're likely to have, I think, are going to be of that kind. So if we get our ecological house in order, our socio-ecological house in order, our solar topic house in order, the likelihood of war will go way, way down, I think. Well, also the question is, can we afford it anymore? I mean, you know, a Athens, uh, Rome, there's plenty of history. The, the ancient Persians, are, are every great democracy or whatever other kind of government there is always uh, destroys itself in empire. And so now we have a, a, a regime coming in, uh, uh, an administration, and they're looking, where are we going to fund all this stuff? It's got to come from the defense budget. And we can't sustain this. And so I think the great challenge, getting an echo solartopia now, one of them is to transition out of uh, the huge military budgets. Now we thought it was going to happen at the end of the Cold War, right? And Clinton was supposed to make this great, we were supposed, what was, it was the peace dividend. Remember we were going to get yes. the peace dividend. So what happened to the peace dividend, you know? I mean, it didn't, uh, now we have no choice. I mean, we had plenty of, well, we had the big computer boom and so nobody seemed to notice how much money was flowing around. We don't have that luxury anymore. The other thing that we need to face, and um, it, it's a part of Ectopia and certainly very explicit in Solartopia, is changing the nature, nature of the corporation. Um, you know, we have had, uh, as you all well know, since the 1880s, corporations in this country have human rights and they don't have human responsibilities. And we're not going to get to either Ecotopia or Solartopia without changing that. I mean, Yeah, I think in the long run that's true. We can do some things. If we had an eco-industrial complex, we could go quite a ways. But in the end, to have a democratic uh, social order that does ecological things as a matter of course, so to speak, uh, does them right as a matter of course, we are going to have to invent some new kind of, of um, economic system because what I was trying to get at in Ecotopia is not capitalism as we know it or socialism as we have known it or anything, really. It's a novel system, well, I call it in the book, worker control, worker ownership which would be a genuinely different relation to what Marx called the means of production or mm -hmm. means of distribution. Is that Groucho or well. Carl? <laughs> uh, the big one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, Marx said some things that people forgot. Uh, and one of them I turn around in my mind a lot. He said, capital has no country. Mm -hmm. Before the age of globalization and utterly ruthless multinationals who couldn't care less whether any given country lives or dies, we didn't really have a very concrete idea of what that meant. But he was right. Capital has no country. If we are going to sustain the country for each other, for a population that can live decently and in a, in a responsible solar-topian way, um, we're going to have to get the grip of capital off of us. Well, yeah, and you know, the marker in the 20th century of the effectiveness of any democracy was 
directly related to the strength of unions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, the Ecotopia really had, thankfully, and very importantly, I thought, a, a clear social conscience. And, you know, uh, poverty cannot exist in either Ecotopia or Solotopia. We cannot sustain. Poverty is unsustainable. Mm -hmm. And um, to, uh, we clearly see now, given the financial crisis, that top-down management of banks, of, of corporation, of, uh, of manufacturing, of distribution, of medicine, also can't be sustained. Uh, it, it, you know, it has to be community controlled. And local. Um, I, I follow the work of the International Forum on Globalization here in San Francisco quite a lot. An old friend of mine named Jerry Mander well, uh, just set for it up. Jerry Mander, who is the guy who gave me the initial grant, oh, really? that wound up being Solartopia. You so. know, he gave me the grant that enabled me to typeset Ecotopia. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right, right, Jerry. Where is Jerry? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they are always talking about what they call a turn toward the local. And that's essential in every aspect of life. That's why I got interested in the Buffalo Project. You know, I was out there looking at the Buffalo in Yellowstone on vacation one time, and I realized that in the great, great plains strip in the middle of the country, they only have two things really going for them. One is grass, the other is wind. Right. Okay, and as you say in Solartopia, um, I didn't get around to it in Ecotopia, I didn't know it at the time, I guess, Buffalo and wind power coexist very beautifully. Right. So in that presently rather backward area of the country, very conservative, very un underdeveloped, you might almost say, uh, is probably the region of the United States or perhaps of the whole world that is in closest reach of genuine sustainability. Right. Because they're not, there aren't very many people and they're not doing very much damage. <laughs> Actually, I think a lot of counties in the, in the Great Plains have fewer people now than they did when in the 1880s. They do. Most of them do. In yeah, fact, yeah. there are some towns that are growing modestly, but the cities themselves, it's back to the, back to the grasslands. Well, let's talk about this. Since we've, we've got feminism, we've got the, the corporations, we've got the end of war, the, the, the next ingredient in both Ecotopia and Solartopia is food, and that four, well, which is a four-letter word along with the other one, which is meat. Now, you know, far be it for me as a vegan who does eat fish, but far be it for me to tell anybody how to eat. But meat, uh, as we grow it now, is not sustainable. You know, commercial, commercially raised uh, feedlot, uh, uh, mass meat-packed uh, hamburger and all that other stuff is not sustainable. We can't have a, an echo of solartopia with that kind of food industry. It's inhumane, too. I happened to go to the California State Fair a couple of years ago, and they were proudly displaying a sow, mother pig, in one of these pipe cages where she couldn't turn around. All she could do was stand up or lie down and uh, eat and poop, and uh, she would lie down and her piglets would nurse along the side. It was a, almost a caricature of the worst jail you could imagine. Right. I tell you, I didn't eat any pork for a while after that. Uh, and But the Ecotopians, of course, are hunters, like the people I grew up among in central Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. They go out and shoot deer every once in a while. Right. And they believe that that's okay because it's a fair struggle. It's pretty hard, actually, to shoot a wild deer. And um, they probably don't do it very often. But they, and they do it with proper ceremonies also, which is an important, you know, the Indians, when we were researching the buffalo uh, thing, the Indians say, the creator gave us the buffalo to take care of, and then the buffalo will take care of us. And I think right. that's a very good model relationship between us and other living beings. Well, and you have to extend compassion to vegetables, too, in my opinion. I mean, the vegetables I have raised, uh -huh. I talk to them, <laughs> then <laughs> well, I eat them. And do they talk back? <laughs> well, let's talk about this. In, since the Great Plains don't really appear in Ecotopia, but they do as we fly over and then Solartopia, um, the presumption is that the meat industry, uh, the, the, the commercial beef industry, has failed because the beef cow is not is a stranger to the, the Great Plains. It's a, a, a hybrid that doesn't really belong there. And so because of the high cost of grain and transportation and uh, feedlotting, which is, you know, there's nothing, echo, there really are very few things, outside of a nuclear plant, there are very few things more destructive of the planet than um, a factory farm, which is, includes the feedlots for the beef cattle, the factories for the chickens, and the hogs and the eggs, and you know these are, and they're oil dependent. They are terribly, yeah. And yeah. So in Solartopia, we see the reversion of the Great Plains to wind, 
and to and to the buffalo. And of course, the wind, the t the towers are great favorites of the buffalo because they can rub up against them, and and they rub the, the big problem is they rub the paint off. That's that's our major. <laughs> <laughs> but buffalo, of course, Ted Turner is has really who's the l largest landowner in the United States is yeah after the federal government has, has brought back yeah, the buffalo yeah. as, as a commercial. And entity. if you're going to eat meat. Buffalo doesn't have antibiotics, doesn't have hormones, very low fat, and so on and so forth. And it tastes, it tastes good if you happen to be a meat eater. Right. Um, in, in the whole way we look at agriculture, incidentally, the thing that always comes back to my mind is that we are presently in net negative energy agriculture. That is to say, we're really eating oil. Right. If we weren't right. pumping all this oil into our agricultural system, we wouldn't have anything to eat or we wouldn't have nearly as much to eat. What we need is to go back to net positive energy agriculture, which is what people have lived on on the planet ever since there were people. And that involves a lot of very important changes, which actually organic farmers are in a good position to make, but traditional agribusiness farmers are not. So I think what happens is that you it's almost like an ecological succession pattern. The organic farmers are doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. they, they are not hurt as much by high fuel prices as the commercial agribusiness farms. And so you will see all over the country, all over the world, a growth, a sort of sprinkling, upwelling pattern of organic, organic low right. energy input farming. And uh, gradually the big uh, farms, I think, are going to die out. It won't be easy, it won't be quick, but in the long run, that's not the way to do agriculture. Right, and of course the, the uh, desirability now of, uh, uh, what do they call them, ranchettes, I guess Bush made that term, uh, ranchette and small, you know, 10 acre parcels where people, retirees or even young people can go and have a garden of an acre or two and, and, um, and really make it uh, with a windmill and solar panels. And, I mean, that's really the future. So um, in, in the solar topian agri agriculture, we see the end of factory farming. Uh, that is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. And it's really got, and we're still finding them in Ohio and elsewhere. They're still trying to make more of these factory farms. And this is a, an interesting, as you mentioned, an interesting sort of um, intersection with the animal rights movement and the inhumanity of these, these you know, sow holding and, and whatever else they do. So um, do people have to give up meat? Well, you know, at least factory raised meat has really got to stop uh, if we're going to have a solar topian setup. Yeah. And, and I mean, uh, I, I have a lot of experience with raising chickens as a kid, and it is perfectly possible to raise chickens. I don't know what the right adjective would be, not humane since they're not humans, but to raise chickens in chickenly ways, <laughs> figure out what really makes chickens guess, feel good, uh, yeah. and um, uh, produce lots of eggs if you don't want to eat meat, uh, or if you're willing to eat them themselves, uh, at least they should have a happy life before they go, which we hope for ourselves and all other living mm -hmm. beings. And again, though, that, that, that sort of agriculture means that people can control their own food supply. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the ecotopian, solar topian model um, and again, I mean, it is a democratic one with a small d, and that, I think that's why uh, Ecotopia has remained such an important book, because it's, it's, uh, it's a grassroots, people-oriented, human-empowering, and feminist, uh, uh, you know, view of the world, and which, you know, so the hardware that comes in with Solartopia and the, the dealing with the corporate issues explicitly, uh, it really comes comes around full circle. Well, they're both very hopeful books. That's, uh, yeah. that's why it's neat to talk with you, because you come <laughs> at it from a very different you know, perspective and getting into it differently than I did. But the results are very uh, parallel, very akin. And uh, I think that people, especially young people in our world, are really hungry for hope. I, think, I don't think it was a dumb thing for uh, Barack Obama to talk about hope so much, because that's a really, really significant thing in right. uh, how people uh, feel about life, what they do, whether they are galvanized into activity or whether they just sort of sit back and wait for things to fall in on their heads. We don't, nobody likes to feel that way. Another major element of ecotopia and solartopia combined, of course, is basic democracy. And, uh, uh, you know, we didn't, this didn't seem to be an issue in the 70s. It's not something we've talked about and it doesn't quite appear as a, an issue in Ecotopia, but I did raise it in Solartopia, which is the question of how we count our votes and whether we actually have fair elections and fair vote counting. And since our experience is, 
in 2000 and 2004, with uh, you know now having had eight years of an unelected president. Uh, in an echo solartopia, I believe and uh, strongly advocate uh, paper ballots. The Canadians count their entire national ballot in four hours. How wow. they do it, I don't know. I guess they have a lot of local election boards who go through the things and write down strokes as they go. And it's all on and, paper. Yeah, it's on paper. It can be rechecked and so on and so forth. And in Ecotopia, I was imagining, well, first of all, I was trying to imagine that politics was really year-round fun. It wasn't something, <laughs> you know, in America, right. political politics, Political parties are like balloons that blow up for a while before right. election, and then after the election, they all go <laughs> and leaving in place just a few key uh, players. But ecotopian politics or solar topian politics would have to be continual affairs where people are involved in what's going on politically all the time, and they have to invent new ways to make it fun, mm -hmm. of which voting is only one, one part of you it. know, and a, a whole series of things that people do. Uh, but it's very dismaying to me that people are losing faith in the fairness of our election counting. Right. That is a really fatal thing for a would-be democracy. Well, I think, uh, to the echo Solartopian credit, and one of the reasons we can have hope is that, uh, thanks to the Internet and the few talk radio shows, certainly no help from the corporate media. In a very short period of time, we had a huge election protection grassroots movement arise in this country. And Ob uh, Barack Obama gets into the White House because these people uh, came out in, in Ohio and elsewhere yeah. and were at the polls and watched the vote count and made sure that it, this one wasn't stolen. Because, uh, you know, in a scant four years, we had the rise of one of the most effective grassroots movements in history. And, you know, that shortening of the knee of the range of time it took to do this is actually very encouraging. It was uh, impressive. In that echo Soratopian way. And so, Japan, Germany, and Canada all have hand-counted paper ballots. And I think, uh, you know, on recycled paper, <laughs> uh, that we need to get rid of the voting machines. The voting machines will make great artificial reefs, I think. You know, they're perfectly designed to steal elections. We cannot have <laughs> in Echo Solartopia any... Uh, and let's hope we have the ballots printed on hemp paper. Yes, now let's it, talk about hemp here. In Ecotopia, hemp is a very big deal. Uh, for one thing, because the government regards marijuana as the least dangerous of all hallucinatory drinks, uh, hallucinatory drugs compared to alcohol, which, and tobacco. you know, and tobacco, which kill hundreds of thousands of people a year. Right. It's a relatively benign substance that can be overused, mm -hmm. of course, as you're, if you're crazy. And there are a lot of people who will overuse drugs what, no matter what they are. But on the whole, hemp is an amazing, amazing plant. Right. And has been a crucial thing in the history of this country and of other other modern countries too. So it's going to come back little by little, uh, partly as medical marijuana in the in that side of things, but also as an industrial product. Yeah, and and, and, and as a food crop, and certainly as a, a basis for uh, biofuels. Uh, hemp is, uh, as many of the people watching know, you you take the seed, you throw it in the ground, it grows, <laughs> and you don't spray it, you don't fertilize it, you don't do anything. You don't have to anyway. And so as a, a source of biofuel, I think hemp is essential but, but as oil uh, for diesel, uh, which, you know, as you know, the original inventor of the diesel engine, strangely enough named Diesel, um, envisioned peanut oil as being the, the basic source. Mm -hmm. And so hemp oil is, is certainly essential in that. And then, of course, for cellulosic ethanol, hemp would be great. It's also a great animal feed. And the seeds, I think, are full of vitamins. Yes, exactly. So uh, the, the founding fathers and mothers, but you know, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, all the founders who had plantations would be astounded, uh, uh, probably in disbelief, to hear that hemp is illegal. It was, uh, and there have been a number of times in American history where the growing of hemp was actually mandatory uh, during the Revolutionary Era and also during World War II. World War II, yeah. Um, uh, all of Kansas was, you know, in hemp. So uh, as a, a step to echo Solartopia, this is clearly a move forward, and it'll be one of the tests, I think, of this administration, uh, how quickly. There's a pretty serious grassroots movement among the farmers in the Dakotas now to get hemp uh, uh, legalized, and I, I just think we'll, it'll, it'll be something that people will wonder how it ever could have been. It yeah, will. why leave it to the Chinese and the Canadians? <laughs> we can do it yes. ourselves. Right, and it'll be, uh, it, I think, you know, you've advocated making uh, the buffalo the national animal of Echo Solartopia. I think hemp will probably be the national plant. Hey. <laughs> well, the great thing, I think, 
you know, your book, uh, Ecotopia, and, and my, our activism with the anti-nuclear movement coincided. And I think the amazing thing that we've had, and it's really great to have hope. I mean, uh, Clinton talked about hope, you know, Hope Arkansas is where he was from, I guess, and all that stuff. But the fact is that since the publication of Ecotopia, and since the beginning of the anti-nuclear movement, and even now with the publication of Solartopia, we have had the luxury of seeing our stuff come true. I mean, from Ecotopia, recycle, you really um, gave birth to a popular vision of recycling that would work. And people instinctually recycle in this country. There is no mm -hmm. economic incentive for the average household on a micro basis to recycle. Everybody does it. And, and, it's, and it came from, you know, yours is the first vision of a society that actually did that. I mean, that must be really gratifying. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the most gratifying things is I predicted a electronic book distribution system ah. where there were essentially uh, sort of large jukebox or, or uh, uh, sort of Xerox-like machines sitting everywhere in schools, in offices, on the street corners, you know, probably in bars, everywhere you uh -huh. can think of. And you could go in and put in your credit card, or as I had them doing quarters, and it would display books and information about books, and you could even read uh, passages the way you can on Amazon. And if you wanted the book, you put in your card, and it printed out the book for you right then, right uh, in a couple of minutes. Well, you got and, that right. You know, this is happening. You right. Can, you can go on the web and look for something called Book Machine, and it'll show you a picture of this thing. Right. How many of them there are? I don't know. Not enough. Well, yeah. be, the Kindle is apparently <laughs> really taking off. It's a similar yeah. thing. Yeah. And they're they're, yeah. they're really uh, doing it that way. Now we envisioned um, uh, community-owned wind power, and that's happening uh, very clearly. I mean, wind wind machines have. Um, well, we had a guy named William Hieronymus, who was at the University of Massachusetts, and he was viewed as kind of a gyro gyrus guy, and he had these ma these pictures of huge wind arrays that would be in the ocean. And everybody said, Pff, you know, and now five megawatt windmills, wind arrays are being manufactured by General Electric to go in the ocean. Now, did they mention William Hieronymus? No, of course not. But, you know, um, we saw photovoltaic cells on every rooftop. That's certainly going to happen. I mean, we all, I already have photovoltaic paint. And uh, I've been in the factories in, outside Michigan. Uh, there's a guy named Stanford Oshinsky, who's really the Einstein of renewables, and he invented the amorphous silicon cell which goes into solar shingles which we you know fantasized about uh there have been some surprises along the way of course uh, the one the favorite one and this gives me hope you know that uh we really gonna there are gadgets that haven't been invented yet the one my favorite new one is the uh tiles in the airports where people walk on these tiles and they, the movement up and down generates electricity it's fantastic so you know uh, the, the point is that the hope that we, we have been having is not just uh, of some fantasy. Uh, I mean, that's why Ecotopia is so great, because so much of it not only was plausible, but it has come true. Yeah. And the attitudes have spread. I don't know. In the, in the end, it's probably the fate of visionaries to be forgotten while their visions are implemented by other people. Other people. That's okay by me. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> fine. You know, uh, uh, except, you know, when the corporate... Well, but the struggle is to keep the corporations from turning them bad. We have seen green technologies, alleged green technologies, go bad. There were those who thought nuclear power... Well, the, the irony is nuclear power was endorsed in the uh, Port Huron Statement. Uh, from the birthing statement of the Students for Democratic Society, the great radical student organization of the 1960s, thought that nuclear power was going to be the magic bullet, as did I. I got a book from my bar mitzvah called Our Friend the Atom, and I used it for a report in ninth grade. And from 1959 to 1973, I thought nuclear power was the magic bullet, you know. And that was, it was supposed to be a green, you know, green thing, and they were still talking about it being green. It's ridiculous, but... Look at trash burning, for example. We thought trash burning was going to be a great answer, but you can't burn plastics. And, you know, there are other things along the way that haven't worked. Um, windmills, you can put windmills in areas that w they will kill birds. We've proved that at Altamont. It's virtually impossible to do it pretty much anywhere else. But, so we have to be careful. Well, it's a learning process, and the more people that get involved with it, the better it will be. Um, some of these people are going to be very non-green-looking people, yeah. and that's okay. Right. As long as they do the right things, it doesn't matter what right. their ideology might be. So I think, uh, you know, keeping hope alive, that was Jesse Jackson's thing and Martin Luther King, all these hopeful people. Um, look, we've, we've been through the Civil Rights Movement. 
And now we have, you know, way, remember way back when we said, oh, someday we'll have a black president? You know, here he is, cleaning up the white guy's mess. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, someday we would have a woman, you know, be president. That was all, almost happened, right? Pretty close. Mm -hmm. uh, someday we'll have Ecotopia and someday we'll have Solartopia. Now we know that these great visions were just the reality of our economic future, I think. It's coming. Yeah. It's well, coming. let's just conclude by saying, since er Ernest and I both went to the University of Chicago, we are the new Chicago school <laughs> of green <laughs> economics, and we can let Milton Friedman turn over in his grave. He can Nolan. turn over in his grave. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> William Mills, hydrogen, photovoltaic cells, solar 